Hello folks, Mark Major here at the Action Figuratorium. That is the name of the studio I'm in where I do my toy photography, which is itself in the back of another studio, a pro commercial studio where clients come in and shoot anything from music videos to corporate advertisements. Yes, that's right. I am a person who has to market to marketing people. And today, what I'm gonna be doing is a little bit of that. I'm going to revisit a topic I had discussed previous in one of my other videos in which I talked about some Kickstarters for some action figure lines or toy related lines to action figures. And I kind of gave my opinion of the toys and of the campaigns. Well, I'm going to be revisiting one of those campaigns today. It is the um, Oddball Frog 112th scale a Bandito 2.0, which is this kind of 1970s Dodge Charger looking car for 112th action figures. 112th action figures, that's your your uh, Star Wars Black Series, your Marvel Legends, your, your new G.I. Joe Classifieds, and uh, tons and tons of other lines now as everybody is trying to get in through that door. So it's worth noting that this car is the kind of vehicle that has an audience for it especially since we just saw a project that was launched by HasLab to essentially produce that same vehicle, but for a lot more than the Odd Frog Entertainment have for theirs, which is on a uh, Kickstarter campaign. So I am going to be putting on my brand manager hat, proverbial, and I'm going to take a second look at their campaign, and I'm going to offer up some things that I think would not only improve the campaign, but I think they have a chance to make this particular uh, product, um, if they do it right, a kind of a runaway hit in a way. So I think everybody needs to definitely stick around. All right, thank you for enduring that intro. New intro coming, better than old intro. No one will even remember the old intro when new intro arrives. So let's um, click over, if you don't mind, real quickly. Um, before I actually get into sort of um, discussing these guys' uh, sales attempt at uh, pushing this forward, um, and what I would recommend that, uh, it, assuming it doesn't fun, if they're going to have a second go at it, what, what you could do. There's a couple things that I'm going to have to uh, discuss with the laity out there so that you will understand when I make these suggestions what it is I'm talking about. But um, before we even get to that, we need to make sure that we know that we're all on the same page here. Uh, this is a Kickstarter campaign to produce a vehicle. This is a picture of the vehicle here with some action figures working on it. It is a 112th scale sort of Dodge Charger type car, muscle car. And the, uh, the opening ask for one of these is $185. Uh, please note that HasLab tried to do a similar vehicle that came with or that... Um, included a Ghost Rider action figure and theirs was $350. The price here is not just important, it is kind of the whole show as I'm gonna point out. But let's switch over and do a little bit of uh, background sort of um, business and marketing 101. Now, um, the first thing that uh, you need to know about launching a product is that you have to have three tiers and it's set up like a pyramid okay you need to have something in the bottom pyramid the bottom part right that is cheap enough to where anybody can take their money and put it up on the counter and buy one you have to make it a, a sort of an entry for a lot of people if you, these guys are trying to hit hundreds of thousands of dollars that they need to raise in order to, to go into production for this thing, that means you have to go wide. If you said, look, we, we only want a little bit of money from a few people who have a lot of money, narrow, that's different. But if this, if you need to get production up, you're going to have to go wide. You need to have some way for everybody to get in at an entry level. Okay, then, right, I think we know what's coming next. You need a mid-tier 
product for people who have a little bit more money and would prefer to spend a little bit mon more money if they get a little bit more for their money. That is, if they get an upgrade that they feel makes it worth it, you need to have a tier available for those people to spend their money. And then the final tier is strictly a luxury item, right? It's overpriced on purpose. You have to have a thing that people who have a lot of money can buy if only for the sake that they have a lot of money. There's people out there who have the kind of money that when you see these like certain kind of toys come out or they come out with a new wave and they're like, are you going to buy the all in all of them? There are people that just look at the most expensive thing and they just buy it with they they shop by the highest price not by the lowest price so you need to create a product for them and you don't need a lot of them you need a few of them it's the tip of the pyramid but it needs to be there okay now that you understand three tiers in pricing right of course we're going to fill in things into those slots that's what this is going to be about but the next thing you guys need to know is essentially demand side pricing something that nobody ever mentions except for me and it sounds like bitching which it is but no one ever mentions in their influencer videos in regards to these like HasLab projects or any of the stuff that comes out there the only thing that people talk about are the supply side pricing and that's the kind of stuff that you get from these um, you know self-proclaimed toy gurus who do community college level PowerPoint presentations. Very good for Business 101, by the way. A definite watch. Everyone should go back and see all of these um, different people who release these types of insider, you know, um, videos. They're just generic Business 101 as it relates to the toy industry. They're not real, actual, hardcore opinions or war stories. They're textbook, but you need to know these, right? And these are things that we've all heard, like, the molds for action figures cost a hundred thousand dollars and become boat anchors um you have to pay for the, the the plastic the pellets you know you have to play uh pay for the um the factory to actually make those you need to pay for someone to assemble them you need to pay for someone to take a little brush of paint and paint them you need to pay for the packaging you need to pay for people to put it in the packaging you need to store the packaging you need to pay for that you need to ship it you need to pay for the shipping okay plus who knows how many other types of uh, grease wheels you need to have rolling on this. Maybe there's a setup fee. Maybe there's an artist fee. Maybe there's some kind of a tax. There's non-ending amount of things that can lead to the back-end price on the supply side. We all know those exist. When somebody shows me a um, Storm Collectibles Golden Axe action figure and I say well that's kind of a lot of money for a generic naked barbarian and they say yeah but new molds what they're missing out is what I'm going to talk about next and that's the demand side okay and what that is is at some point in these companies there's a meeting it's between decision makers and analysts the decision makers will ask the analysts how many of this unit can we sell at this price? How many of this unit would we sell at this price? If we lower the price, do we sell more units and make more money in the long run? Or can we push it? Can we raise the price and people will still pay it? The goal of these meetings is to figure out the highest priced widget at the largest quantities. Now, once you have that, you then ask the question, can we make the product for this price that gives us the profit margin that we want? If the answer is no, you either have to go back and pick a new number or you have to go back and redesign your product to fit into that budget. This is why you will see toy companies coming out with previews at up and coming toys and then when they release, they look different or have something different about them. Like uh, they'll show them with six accessories. It eventually ships with two. They show them with all this paint. It has no paint on it. They show it with like a bunch of articulation. There's no articulation. They went back and they couldn't hit that number. So they had to change the product. Now, this seems to be what is not really happening in the toy industry, right? There is not this meeting where someone says, how many of these can we actually sell at this price? 
what they seem to be doing is just looking strictly at the cost, making a product and saying, oh, it costs this. Even though one says, well, it's cool, we all like it, but we're not going to pay that kind of money for it. If a loaf of bread costs this, your toy can't then cost this. Even if it's cool, even if the mold was $200,000 and will become three or four boat anchors in the future, it doesn't matter. If people don't want to spend that money for it, the product shouldn't exist. It can't exist because you're just going to waste money making this thing that has extremely low sales. So now that we understand the concept of pricing something based upon what people want to pay or are willing to pay rather than what it costs to make and then figuring it out in reverse, and now that you understand that when you launch a product you need three tiers, a cheap, a middle, and an expensive, let's take a look at what these guys could or should be doing in regards to this car. Now, um, I have to say that uh, I do like the vehicle a lot. I love those kind of old, cool sort of muscle cars that you saw in a lot of uh, movies like Vanishing Point and, of course, Mad Max and things like that. Everyone thinks it's cool. Um, but we need to figure out the price that people are willing to pay for this, okay? And um, uh, I'm going to hypothetically pretend I'm the analyst from that previous, you know, scenario I laid out. And I'm going to just take a hypothetical proverbial number out of kind of what feels good. I haven't done any research, okay, so that's another someone needs to do that. But for the discussion and sake of this particular video, right, I'm going to say that the magic number for this car is $99 or less. Not $99 plus or minus. It can't be $105. It could be 95, but it can't be over. Okay, it's got to be under 100 bucks. Now, before people start screaming about their golden axe action figure, right, um, and how much this costs, okay, you have to ask yourself in terms of the casual purchaser, in terms of going broad, in terms of making a product that appeals to uh, enough people to where they can get it, you have to ask yourself what is important about this. Is it important that the trunk open? No. Is it important that the hood open? No. Is it important that the doors open? Yes. Is it important that you could take the top off and move the action, uh, move the chairs around and put figures and put jam your Hulk in there or whatever, your juggernaut? I don't know. Uh, yes, it is. I think it is. Is it important to have a dashboard that looks great for 4K photography? No, it is not. And so, right there, you could see ways with which you could skimpify this thing and continue to lower the cost of production so that you could sell it. Now, granted, there's a good chance that if you could sell this thing for 99 bucks, that you probably couldn't make it for $50, so the margins are going to be weak but you're going to sell a lot of them and I'm going to discuss why and why I think that this vehicle, this exact vehicle or the next person who comes along and does this is going to be kind of the future of vehicles, at least at one twelfth scale. So if you got a scaled down, super generic, and when I say super generic, like if it costs money to put that logo on it, no logo on it, right? If it costs a little extra money for, uh, you know, for the grill to look a certain way, don't do it. Uh, if there's a thing that you think it's got to have, a special kind of doodad thing, don't put it on. That's how you get this thing to $99. And when you show the next tiers up, you actually are going to have to provide a step up from the lower tier to prove to the next tier that that's worth the money. And that's exactly what this thing is about because the way you do this is you got to come up with a car that itself is actually total, totally modular to be modded, upgraded, and kitted out. Okay, that means you need to have um, some type of non-discrete uh, pegs or, um, or slots that will allow you to uh, plug in blowers, uh, add extra sort of cool uh, accessories and utensils to it. 
um, you need to have a little compartment ready to go and lines run so that you can get a lighting kit, a little LED lighting kit that you put in there, or a little sound box that goes in there, right? Maybe you make it so that if you pop up the back part, you can actually put in a working trunk. You pop up the front part, you can put in a working hood with engine block in it, right? But you got to make this thing modular because what you're going to want to eventually do is just sell stock platforms with which third party people could make kits for this thing. In addition to you sell your own kits and in fact you sell the kits with the Kickstarter initially, but eventually if this becomes well, I'm going to use the term evergreen product and I have a video on is there such a thing as an evergreen product. This could be a sort of first of evergreen products where this thing could just be a stock generic muscle car called muscle car and, and people will buy these things forever because there's always going to be a shop that sells new kits for it whether they're like the holiday kit or the Mad Max kit, you know, that like has the little door for the dingo dog to sit right inside the uh, inside the car with Max and the blower goes on top and, uh, you know, decals of like dust and dents and things like that. You're going to do a kit where it's like make turns it into a rally car where you you pop on red rims and you have a little, you know, uh, number on the side, you know, black black number on white circle, that kind of thing fog lights on the top, you're going to want to make kits for this thing and you're going to want to encourage other people to make kits for it because that's going to mean that you're going to sell more cars. So the entry level is going to be the car with stock nothing, um, totally vanilla. The mid-level is going to be where you take and you actually do the upgrades to it. You do the upgrades that gives you some type of working trunk and working hood and a better dash plate and a better front end, right? Um, you do that one for your mid-level and you charge okay money for it. And then for a luxury one, you just have a couple of these that are totally custom out where they have gold rims, they've got a gold sparkle finish, they've got some type of Aztec mural on the side, uh, blinged out. Um, and is it really like worth the money for like the paint and the artistry behind it? No, not really. But because people buy those things simply because they can afford it, you will sell them. And you don't need a lot of them. You just have to have somebody in the actual chop shop making about 10 of these dogs to fulfill this type of three-tiered Kickstarter. But the main thing about this is that you're going to want to create a $99 stock 112th muscle car with which anybody can upgrade and make it unique in a specific character, right? and let other people participate in that. I think that that is the key moving forward. And I think if you did it with first a muscle car like this and then move to another type of car, of course, everyone brings up like the Punisher van or the Mutant Ninja van because I have one of those and I just repainted the shit out of that thing, right? And it's going to become something totally ludicrous coming up, right? You can do that. You can come out with, an, with another vehicle of an archetype that anybody can then make kits for and upgrade, including yourself. So that's what I think of uh, the main plan if you're going to be a vehicle uh, company going forward with this type of scheme of being like sort of indie creators who create uh, custom vehicles for just a small group of maybe 5,000 people. Um, here's an interesting uh, video. This is on the channel ML series. The guy's only got 99 subscribers. I think if anybody sees my video and sees his video, go to his channel, subscribe to him so he gets to 100. I think that's exciting. And if anything is uh, brought good about this video, it's that. So this video is um, where he took somebody's design, 3D design for like a little kind of a Humvee style um, uh, vehicle, military vehicle, and he blew it up and then figured out a way to 3D print it. And he's loading it up here with these, um, 
Looks like he's got some Valiverse and maybe some G.I. Joes uh, slogging it out. And this thing looks great, but I asked him in the comments, I said, hey man, <clears throat> how much did you pay in resin for that thing and how many hours was that printer working? Because, you know, there's limitations to this. And uh, only $60 in resin, and that's, that's not bad. And uh, I don't know if there's ways to improve that, uh, but about 200 hours, he said, in, uh, in printer. And so you need to take into account electricity and the investment in printer and also time it took to learn those things. I mean, I got one and I haven't even, I don't know how you turn it on yet, but when I get there, more vids about it, trust me, can't stop talking about anything. So, so at about, you know, um, $60 homemade materials for this thing. Eh, is it possible to get to a $99 sort of level? I think it totally is. And uh, one of the reasons why I think that is because um, I saw a, uh, another video recently about a, um, a guy who toured the AirFX uh, model uh, kit manufacturer in England and so he went to the factory there where they make model kits and as you know England is a first world country it's not a third I know people who live there are like mm, you should really look around a bit more but okay but for the most part you know what I'm saying everyone's like ah oh, you can't do you can't make things in America or you can't make things here or there because it's you got to make them in China they make a lot of their kits at the factory in the UK it's a first world country um, they had a video where they were showing them the giant huge mold and the, you know, the sprues or whatever on the coming out and things like that. The trees with all the models on them, they're looking at them, doing quality assurance and stuff like that. And these guys are making a model kit that, you know, the little Spitfire or whatever they make sells for like 30, 35 bucks. But they also do a 1 12th size Bentley that sells for about 110, 15, 20 or though, 100 and some change for a 1 12th Bentley. So it's not, it's, you know, it's, it's not that insane. It's not that crazy. It's not that wild that you could, um, you could actually come up with a, uh, an archetype vehicle and sell it for around $99 for a car, um, 50, 60 bucks for a Vespa. You know, I'm sure people would buy one twelfth Vespas. I got a couple that I've picked up. Um, you could, you know, maybe even a little bit less, actually, if you think about it. Um, maybe a little bit more for Humvees and vans, things like that. Use the car, 100 bucks as your, as your um, you know, benchmark. But that's really what I think it's going to take to move a product like this, is to have something broad and wide, which anybody can afford, and everyone's going to want to get one and do their own thing with it. Anyways, that has been this uh, episode of the Action Figuratorium. As always, um, comment with what you don't like, and, um, and I'll do my best to agree. So with that, I will uh, catch you guys on the next one.